Now, Brother Todd Conklin is, I guarantee, going to help us on that endeavor on thinking differently and being challenged. Mr. Todd Conklin. Okay. So what have you guys been up to the last three years? Talk to me. Are you glad to be back? Yeah, yeah isn't this kind of weird, though? I mean, it's, it's borderlines. You're like, this whole oh, thing, does this work or is this sim <laughs> It feels symbolic to me. I will not tell you it works. Yeah, okay, but it, it feels symbolic. So before I even go up there to get started, I, I have to tell this story because it's on my brain. And for some of you, you've heard this story because it's a true story. But for others of you, this is the first time. It has to do with the way the room is set up. So <clears throat> I spent a long, long time working at this place, Los Alamos National Laboratory. And I delivered, I don't even know, a bazillion classes. And the way they would do it is they would tell me the class starts usually 30 minutes before the class begins. So I'd be there on time, right? <laughs> so a couple years ago, I'm in our training center. If you've ever been there, it's really a nice facility. And I walk into the classroom they've assigned me, and it's set up in these round tables, which is super weird for us. I mean, we're a schoolboy. You know, those little skinny, that's us. We're, we're, that's our training. And so it was clearly set up for another meeting. And a better person probably would have taken the tables down and changed them. I'm not that guy. OK, because it's your dish, I designed, I, right? So I walk in there, and it's set up in these round tables. And the most amazing thing happens. They tell me the class is supposed to start at 8, but there's nobody in the room. Now, I'm with my people, so I can speak pretty openly with you guys. I don't know what you think about that, but that is my biggest fantasy. <laughs> Isn't it yours, kind of? To have a safety class and no one shows up? Because you know what that means. Half day off, nothing scheduled. I didn't even have to go back to the office. I could go right to the donut shop. They'd think I'm training. It was going to be perfect, right? So I'm like, this is great. Nobody's here. But I think I should wait a little bit because that seems appropriate. What if somebody comes, right? So I'm sitting in the corner, and sure enough, the first two people that are supposed to take the class come in. And they're both field-level superintendents. So how many of you guys have taught a class full of field-level superintendents, just by show of hands? OK, so you know exactly. If you haven't taught the class, basically, they sit in the room, cross their arms, and dare. Actually, that look, right? See him? That's the look. You, you know what he's saying? I dare you to teach me something. Just come on, blab it out, right? So the first two guys come in, and they probably don't see me because I'm kind of hiding in the corner as much as I can hide, right? But they walk in, and the guy turns to the guy next to him, and he goes, crap, round tables, just like that. <laughs> well, now I'm kind of interested because I wonder what's going to happen next. And his friend says, what's the problem? And he goes, I hate round tables. And his friend says, why? And he says, because it means at some point during this stupid training, they're going to make us touch each other. <laughs> It was a real dilemma, you guys, because I was like, we should do the trust fall deal. This is the one. But unfortunately, I did. I am so happy to be here, and I have so much to share with you guys, because I don't know what you've thought about the last three years. I'm guessing you have lots of opinions. But I'm going to suggest for a group that comes together, an august body like this, to talk about learning, this is perhaps the biggest learning opportunity of our entire career. And I'll bet you, and you guys tell me if I'm wrong, because I'm wrong on a bunch of junk, but I'll bet you the one thing that you came out of this knowing is more. You know more about how you feel about work, for sure. You knew more about how the organization responds to uncertainty, for sure. And you've probably learned some really important lessons, like what matters and what doesn't matter, what makes a difference and what doesn't make a difference, those are all really important questions. And the one thing I'll say before we kick off is that if you haven't had the conversation yet, both with your leadership above you and the workers, the vital experts that work with you every single day, you should probably be asking two questions. And it's not too late. The first question you want to ask is, during the past three years, when the world changed, what did you miss? And ask them that question. And what's remarkable about that is they will have an answer for you. They absolutely will tell you, this is where we need administrative support. This is where we need leadership 
assistance. This is where we need systems that help us be more successful in the work we do. And that question's really valuable. But within the same breath, I want you to also ask question two. And that is, over the past three years, things changed dramatically. What did we take away that we don't need to bring back? And what's remarkable about that is that that answer, I think, is perhaps the greatest opportunity for us as organizations and for us as individuals to learn. Because I promise you guys, I don't even have to promise you guys because you live in this world, there's a lot of crap that went away that does not need to come back. Like, for example, this is just the one I think about a lot, is there was an organization that took five signatures to do an isolation, right? Now, I'm going to grant you that in the process and slow drift over time, those five signatures at one point must have made sense, right? Because that's how they were built into the system. But during the last three years, getting those five signatures was pretty difficult to do, so they reduced it really down to two signatures, and what did not happen? Anyone want to guess? They didn't have a lot of events, and in fact, they continued to do work. One of the challenges that that organization had is, do we really need to go back to those five signatures? Is their data sufficient to actually push us back into the old way of doing business? And I'm going to suggest, again, before we even get started, that there's so many stories like this in your organization. So many places where we can come out of this strong. So if I say the term VUCA, do you guys know what I mean? Yeah, this is yes, this is no. If you phone with the mouth, we'll tell Charles there's an AV problem and we can watch him have another little heart attack. I mean, which is always kind of fun to watch. So if you don't know VUCA, first of all, that's fine. I don't think you have to know VUCA, except that I'm going to suggest you probably want to know VUCA. VUCA actually comes, the origin story is a little bit fuzzy, but it actually comes out of special operations in the United States military. And VUCA is going to stand for four, it's an acronym, right? And it's going to stand for four terms that in this room you guys know more about than probably anyone else in your organization. Okay? It's a bold statement, but I'm ready to support it. VUCA stands for Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Everybody with me? Okay. Why are you the experts on that? Because our job has traditionally been forever and ever to manage <laughs> uncertainty. Do, 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 do. Any slide will do. I'm fully prepared for anything. Oh, I don't know. My brother, you're there for me. Right? Now, the reason I talk about this uncertainty thing is the next slide says, if you were to imagine this next slide, this, this is as good as my slide. We're, if this doesn't work, you're not missing crap, because this is what they look like, right? <laughs> but the next slide says the world is uncertain. And one of the most important things about this idea of VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, is not necessarily those four components. Because I will tell you that operationally, those four components have always existed and they will always continue to exist. Volatility, think of it like this. We don't really know what will happen next. And because we don't know what happens next, we're in a position where we can't really successfully predict the future. Here's my good news. We've never really been good at predicting the future, because if we were really good at predicting the future, we would not be here. We'd be on Barry's yacht that he got from some Russian oligarch Oh, Barry, act like you're not getting up there, dude. It's just a matter of time till you have your own yacht. And we'd be in the Mediterranean someplace in bikinis having the same meeting. You're a visual thinker, aren't you? Because when I said bikinis, her mouth went like this, a little vomit just kind of. I look good in a bikini. I mean, I'm better in a one-piece. Let's just get that out there, but, but that's good, right? 
So volatility is this idea that you, you don't have the ability to really predict the future. But I'm going to suggest to you that one of the challenges we have as an organization is that our organization really wants to be able to predict the future. Can, can anyone guess why that's important? Well, the answer is really simple. If we can predict the future, we can control the future. And so every single conversation you've had, and you've had a million of these around this idea of finding leading data, right? We want leading data. I want you to think about it as a function of VUCA. And I want you to think about it as an organizational response to the fact that if we can't predict the future, then we can't feel like we can control the future. And that's a really important part of what we want to talk about, which leads us ultimately to the notion of uncertainty. Now, uncertainty has helped us in our jobs because uncertainty has introduced a new discussion at the leadership level. And that discussion is the idea that progress happens in small incremental steps and that the most powerful tool your leadership team has is in the ability to try something, collect information on that, and then either continue to do that thing or to stop doing that thing. But what's happened, and you know this because you live in this world, is that now our leadership teams are having to make big decisions based upon very, very small amounts of information. They don't like that. They want the most information they can possibly get. They even want information that they don't know is coming, right? They'll wait for data that they don't even know is out there because more data makes better decisions. But here's what we've learned, is that in fact, that's not the world in which we operate. And that where we operate is in a position where we make small incremental motions, we collect the information on those motions, and then we either stop it and act like it was someone else's idea, or we continue and move forward to get better, which takes us to complexity. What do we know about complexity? So let me ask this question, because a bunch of you guys are sort of on this journey. And this, I think, is one of the more difficult notions to grasp early. So let me start by saying, is there a difference in your mind between the word complicated and the word complex? And don't tell me spelling, because I totally get that they're spelled. One's got an X in it, one doesn't. I'm, I'm there already. Are they different terms? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And in fact, we'll define them. Would they be seen as different terms in operational and production discussions within your organization? Probably not. And that's OK. There's nothing wrong with that at all, because I'm not sure being the egghead that has the big discussion all the time between the difference of complexity and, and complication makes you more popular at a party. I mean, I, I don't think it makes it better. But I think it's vital to what we want to talk about. And, and the reason I would share the vitalness of this is pretty simple. If something is complicated, how would you define something complicated? So advancing slides, <laughs> clearly complicated. So what, what's the definition of complicated? Yeah, hard to do, right? Hard to understand, difficult to do. So like juggling and riding a unicycle seems complicated to me, right? So if that's the definition for complicated, then what's the definition for complex? And this is really important in this room. Lots of moving parts, which is, a, that's like 90%. Like, right now, I will tell you, you get to leave five minutes early. <laughs> you could have left eight minutes early if you'd have said one other thing. Lots of moving parts that are tightly coupled, okay, that fit together. So think Jenga blocks. And if you want to think Jenga blocks, I noticed on Ray's table, there are Dallas Cowboy Jenga blocks. Really? That seems like a different sport to me. I don't know. I mean, maybe Dallas Cowboys plays Jenga, but they're out there, right? So Jenga blocks are really important in understanding the notion of complexity. Now, why does this matter? Well, I'm about to give you the secret weapon. Complicated systems we make better through simplification. Fair enough? Yeah, no, that's not hard, right? That's not hard at all. 
complex systems can never be simplified. So the solution from us as learning experts is that complex systems, you make the couplings transparent. Does that make sense? So let's think about what you do for a living. Let's think about operational learning. Let's think about investigations. I mean, that, that's a great place to go. Let's think about whatever type of analysis you're using to actually eventually create corrective action. It's a pretty good bet that every operational upset you have is not an operational upset that happens because the work was complicated. And if you are having operational upsets because the work is complicated, I'm gonna make you a frickin' rock star. You should swing into action and say, let's make this more simple, <laughs> right? Let's make it hard to do it wrong and easy to do it right. Oh look, it's, yay! Good work, my brother. Take tomorrow off. Oh hell, take today off nonetheless, okay, right? right? That notion is really going to be important. But for complex systems, which it's a pretty good bet, every operational upset you look at is a function of the complexity. It's a function of the couplings. What you want to do is understand that our job as learning guides is to actually make those places where the system combines the joints in the Jenga stack knowable. And when you make them knowable, what happens is that that actually allows the adaptive nature of the workers in real time to be more successful. So what you do for a living, I mean, to sum it up, it seems like kind of an easy way to say it, is you make the couplings that exist in your complex organization known. Your work shines a light on the place where two complex systems come together, where supply chain and production meet, right? Those are really, really valuable. Which leads us to the last part, which is the word ambiguity. What do you guys think about the word ambiguity? Any strong opinions one way or the other? You knew that was coming, right? I mean, that's a pretty easy hit. What, what's your impression of it? It's, it's kind of vague, right? By definition, it's vague. What's amazing is that most of the operational world in which your workers succeed is not a world filled with clear expectations and instruction. It's actually a world filled with ambiguity. And what workers do in real time, I really am of mixed brains whether you should tell them they're good at this or not, because I'm not sure feeding their ego makes the world a better place. But what they're constantly doing is taking very ambiguous parts of work and disambiguating them, making them clear. The quick answer is you don't really pay workers to follow procedures. In fact, I'll just say this. I mean, jump in and argue with me. Procedural adherence, rote procedural adherence, is actually really easy to do. It's non-ambiguous. This is the rule, I'm gonna follow it, right? I'm gonna work this rule, and anything that happens outside of the rule, screw you, I'm on the rule, right? The problem is, is that if that's the way they think, operations would cease. What the worker is constantly doing is not being paid to follow the procedure. They're being paid to manage the variability that happens on an operational daily basis to the normal work that takes place. And my favorite story on this, and this is a true story, and it is really one of my favorite stories, and a bunch of you in this room will get this, is I'm with this big, august body, board of directors, senior leadership team of this big mining company, and they had just killed three people. So three people died like the week before. Not in one accident that kills three people, but in three accidents in the same week that killed three different people. So let's just say the freak out factor was super high. And I said, your system is really ambiguous around the presence of control around your critical operations. Long story short, 
Two of those people drowned in bulldozers. Now, I don't know how much background you have in this. I got zero. And even with zero background in this, pretty sure bulldozers don't float. Just tossing it out there. I mean, I've never actually been on the lake and said, hey, look, who's that in the bulldozer? I mean, that hardly ever happens, right? And when we talk to them about, well, how do people die by drowning in a bulldozer? Long story short, bunch of learning teams, lots of analysis. The egress hatch had been welded shut. And the reason they weld that egress hat shut is because if it's not welded shut, a lot of dust gets in. And so in order to keep that dust out, we're going to weld the exit hat shut, which means when the bulldozer falls into the water, you can't really get the cab door open, so you can sort of write the ending. And the boss, he didn't like me very much, because I said, Tony, you'll appreciate this. I said, your operations are out of control. Now, I don't find that, do you? I don't find that terribly offensive. Do you, I mean... Like, I can think of a lot more offensive crap to say. I mean, a lot, like, I wouldn't have to think about it very hard, and I can think of more offensive stuff to say. But in this case, that really made the CEO angry. And he said, well, let me just take one on for you. And I said, absolutely. Let's have an argument. That'll make it better. And he said, there's a major crossroads in our facility that has a yield sign, and people don't respect that yield sign. And I said, are you kidding me? You're going to actually have a discussion on how wrong I am? And the example you're going to bring up is a damn yield sign? Really? Right? I mean, I got to tell you, that's just crazy talk. Because I said, what does a yield sign mean? And what do you think a yield sign means? This is your part. So here's how the whole conference is going to be like this. People are going to ask you questions. <laughs> Then they're going to look at you kind of lovingly. That's what's going on now. Do you feel it? And then when they do that, you should make some stuff up and say it back. And if you say it with enough confidence, the speaker will go, yeah, you're really good at that. So we're out of it. What's a yield sign mean? Yeah, so the crazy thing about using a yield sign is the example to tell how wrong I was because he's mad at me because I said his operations were out of control is he could have used anything else in the world and probably won that argument. But he chose a yield sign. Here's what I'm going to tell you. A yield sign is an excellent example of operational ambiguity. Because depending on the context, right, that's going to dictate what that sign means. It's like the flashing yellow turn signal indicator thing. I don't really have a clue what that means. I mean, I learned yesterday on the drive up here that means speed up. I mean, just <laughs> get out of the way as fast as possible. This notion of ambiguity is really, really, really significant. And one of the things that is important for us to talk about is that ambiguity as it moves up the organization seems less ambiguous. So in the boardroom, around the management table, this is as clear as the nose on your face. The problem is, is depending on context, that yield sign either means stop or go. Why do I bring this up? Why do I talk about VUCA? Well, because I think the most important thing I'm going to tell you is that the research done by the Special Forces people and the many books that have come out recently around this VUCA idea all say the same thing, that the solution for uncertainty is to increase diversity of learning. And so the key is, is when you're met with the last three years, the challenge is, is that the one thing that should have dramatically improved is the organization's ability to learn from itself. And that the only way you learn as an organization is to talk to more people, not to less people. And that idea is really important to what we want to talk about. So when I say increase diversity, I mean every form of the word diversity you want to use. Because in this meeting, you know exactly what I mean. But where I would challenge you is that this is the place where you ask people that don't normally have a voice at the table that don't normally have a voice 
in the corrective action generation part of the equation. And one of the most important things that I learned during the last three years is that Zoom and Teams and that stinking WebEx that just takes over your entire computer, that one, all of a sudden you're looking at porno you didn't even know existed. <laughs> you're like, where'd this come from, WebEx? Oh, yeah, no wonder. Well, wait long enough, it'll go away, right? right? Is that Zoom, to a great extent, was the great equalizer. And what's amazing is people who didn't often have a voice at the table were the same size block as Barry or me. And that what's interesting is that chances for voices to be heard that had not been traditionally heard in our organization became more available. And I think that's cool. But what I think is even cooler is the people who used to hog the leadership meetings, they became just one more cog in the goal. And so that's really an important part of what we want to talk about and where we head. Where does this take us? Well, the quick answer is that maybe I could use some of these slides. We'll see if they work. Are you ready? So you know this because it was already drawn. I still think this model is powerful. And the reason I think it's powerful for us is because the improvement you've seen around operational reliability has one origin. And the origin is learning. So the crazy thing about learning is that learning allows the organization to sustainably improve. And the key, because I looked at Sketch, but now I have to unload it and load it back. I just learned all that with you guys this morning, right? Is that for a long time, we were interested in generating the best answers. But now we're smarter. And I think the pandemic helped us understand this, that the answers are not nearly as significant as the questions. And the one thing we all share on this journey, because many of us in this room have been on this journey a while together, is that we realize now that the power you have in asking better questions changes the organization's ultimate state. I was just on a call right before this meeting where a company said to me, how do we better manage contractor safety? So I'm just going to bet almost all of you in this room have been to that meeting. Anybody not been to that meeting? I mean, the, the, that, if you're going to guarantee that question's coming up, that one is one you could count on. What's so funny is I thought about it this morning before I came here. And in the old days, we just said that you really want to create clear expectations, and you want to really focus on metrics, and you want to drive that contractor towards the behavior that aligns with the organization in which you represent. But I thought about it today. And what I thought about today is that that's not the answer I gave. The answer I gave is if you want better contractor engagement, ask better contractor questions. Ask them not about scope, schedule, and budget, although those questions aren't going to go away, but ask them about the readiness to start a job safely, the assurance that controls are in place, that in fact, you're going to start a job that, ready for it, when it fails, it has the elegance to fail with the least amount of impact possible on operations, production, safety, and reliability. Now, I don't know what you're thinking, but that's not the question we'd asked five years ago. But now that question, interestingly enough, seems to be incredibly powerful in helping that contractor become a part of that journey. And so compliance, which worked really well for a long time, compliance provided the beginning of the discussion. Compliance always provides the beginning of the discussion. And one of the amazing things about compliance is that compliance sets the stage, but it's not worth a crap in monitoring long-term improvement. Because compliance is not terribly interested in learning. You don't ask a lot of questions about compliance. It shall be done, or you shall find another place to work. I'm working with a big organization right now. Um, I'm not supposed to say the name of them, but they're an oil and gas company located in Holland that rhymes with the word hell. 
but only has an S in the front of it, <laughs> right? So seriously. And they call me in, they say, get ready, because if you know anything about this organization, you're going to clutch your pearls. Don't act like you've never clutched your pearls before. Come on, I can tell, right? They said, we want to get rid of our life-saving rules. Now, I, I never in a million years thought that would happen because Shell started the life-saving rules. That, they're, they're the origin of that idea. But here's what they said. We believe that the life-saving rules stop learning. That's the challenge with compliance, which takes us right into process safety design, which is amazing because it focuses on the system, but it's really led us to this capacity model, right? Whatever you want to call it, hop or human performance or whatever. I mean, I'm not really that wrapped up in what it's called, but what it does is it looks beyond compliance and it looks beyond system design and it looks at the place where the work meets the workers. And what's amazing is what we've learned, and in this room there's much knowledge, is that that's the place that's filled with volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. But here's the payoff. What amazes me about this journey is this. What scares me more than anything, and it always has, is the fact that really stable, really safe organizations still kill people. Well, how could that be? They have the best OSHA reportable numbers in the country. They are rock stars, right? They're doing it right. They, they, they kill it out there. When in reality, here's what we know, is that fatalities aren't like industrial accidents. That the things that kill people are not the same things that hurt people. Like in the history of mankind, hardly anybody ever dies of an ankle sprain. Seriously, it's pretty rare, right? And yet we spend the same amount of time understanding ankle sprains that we do looking at big, high-consequence failure. Now, we can act like that's not true, but it's completely true. The vast majority of time that leadership spends on safety is talking about things like Fred fell on the ice. Want to know why Fred fell on the ice? It's slippery. Asking Fred not to fall at no level makes ice less slippery. It just doesn't. That's not how it works. What's amazing to me is really recognition of the power of operational learning has allowed us to have an impact on significant events. And the reason is, is because significant events aren't a function of a failure to prevent the event. Significant events are a function of a failure control the event. And here's what I'm going to tell you, and my bet is everybody else that talks, even around your table, is going to say the same thing. We don't get to manage risk, because risk is a normal part of your operational fabric. Risk is dynamic, and it's ever-present. Risk hates a vacuum. As soon as you take a risk away from the operations, what happens? Did I wake you guys? No. The vacuum sucks three new things into its risk hole, and now you're triply risky, or triply more risky than you were the minute before. The amazing thing about learning is that it's changed the way we think about managing operations. Risk is not the problem. It's the capacity to have risk. That's what you manage. And what you constantly do is actually monitor the capacity to have high-risk operations. And so what that means is, if risk is high, capacity should be larger. If risk is low, capacity by definition could be smaller. And what's, bless you, and what's remarkable about that comment is in this room, you've sort of been thinking these things before, but that is earth-shattering to operations. Because we've told them their entire career that our job is to reduce risk. And here's what we know. 
risk is a normal part of the daily operations. It's a part of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. That what we actually create is a system that has the ability to control for risk. That's enormously important to what we do. So where does this take us? Well, one of the questions I want to ask for you guys, and I put this in special, so I'm kind of glad it works, is this one. Why is it, over time, we've become fixated with looking at failure in order to define success? Does anyone else have an issue with that? Because for the most part, if you look at your operations, they're mostly successful. In fact, it's relatively rare and becoming more rare, congratulations and thank you for your service, that failure happens. Now, I'm going to suggest the reason is, is because the organization has more capacity to manage VUCA and they're getting better at it, but that's a different discussion. What's amazing to me is I think the talent you have in this room is better engaged in learning from normal work than it is from learning from failure. And our challenge, I think, as a group is to help redefine when it is we do our analysis. Waiting for failure to take place in order to analyze a process that we know failed strikes me a little bit like shutting the barn door after, is it cow or horse? Well, I got corrected the other day on this, and I never thought it mattered. And I grew up in western stinking Kansas. I mean, I do you know this about me? I had 26 people in my high school graduating class. And I'm not bragging, but I was in the top 10. OK, let's just get that out there. So right? But the notion that the talent and the skills that we have, really throughout our organization to learn, is almost wasted on using it to actually understand an accident is a discussion I think we need to have in this room probably with the door closed. Because at no point am I saying we shouldn't do accident investigations. I mean, that needs to happen because we need to learn from failure, absolutely. But what I would suggest is, is that the tools you bring to the table are probably so much richer and so much more valuable if we looked at normal operations and understood what normal looks like. And that actually really leads us to an important question. And the question I want to take you to, and I want you to actually spend a little bit of time at your table, and I'm coming to this back table first because you guys should be sufficiently spanked for getting that good of a table in this conference, okay? So let's just get that out there. I want you to answer this question. What's happening when nothing's happening. Go. All right, what did we come up with? So let me stop you long enough to tell you we could do this exercise forever, and if you're not doing this in your organization, please do so. Because there's two answers that could come out of this. What's happening when nothing's happening? And either one of these answers, I think, tees up learning. And there's probably not a wrong answer. In fact, I'll say it. I don't think there's a wrong answer. But this is really important analysis work, and it really sets the stage for your organization to learn. So what's happening when nothing bad's happening? One answer you're going to get from your leadership team is they're going to say, we got lucky. Okay? And if they say that, that's fine, because that actually introduces an opportunity for you to actually pull the string on that a little bit and ask this question, really? Help me understand what you mean. And maybe what you'll learn is an entire part of the operation where we really are lucky. The other answer you're going to get, which I think is probably sexier and certainly more interesting for us, is they're going to say our processes, our training, our qualification, our supervision, our controls, and our systems function exactly the way we want them to. That's amazing. And if you learn that, that allows you the opportunity to have a much different conversation as you move forward. The key here is the realization 
that when nothing bad is happening in your organization, there's a lot of people up and down the chain that are working really hard to ensure nothing bad happens. But that takes us to zero. If I could do anything for you in the world, it would be to ask you to dump zero. For goodness sakes, don't measure nothing. That's stupid. But what it really does, and this is the part I want to challenge you on, is it almost discredits the training, the qualification, the leadership, the communication, the engagement, the controls, the processes, and the procedures. It almost discredits all the things we know that make operations most effective. Never, ever motivate your organization to do nothing, ever. Which takes us to really this book that they asked me to talk about. If you really want an interesting project to do during the pandemic, I would encourage you to write a book with Sidney Decker. Because <laughs> the problem with uh, my ego and Sidney Decker's ego, they don't really fit in the same place that well, right? But what's interesting is we started to look at this, and we said this move from outcome to capacity is vital. And the very best way I can phrase this for you, you don't even need to buy the book, is I want you guys to think about the fact that safety is not something the organization has. It's something the organization does. That's really vital. Work is done versus work is imagined. We can talk about that forever, but here's what we know. The work your guys do as interpreted in the boardroom never involves a bulldozer falling into water. The work that the guys were doing in real life, they were dropping bulldozers seriously, I'm not making this up, about twice a month. The miraculous thing to me is why more people didn't die. And I will tell you that they replaced all the escaped hatches in all their bulldozers, and I got a call from that guy who hated me, the yield sign guy, and he said, we had another event, and the guy swam away. And I said, that, my friend, is a success. And he said, it doesn't feel like it, but I think you're right. Right? When things go wrong, we have to investigate differently. You've got an entire week of that discussion. When there's too much compliance, for God's sakes, ask the two questions. What did you miss? What do we need to get rid of? Right? When your safety people are getting beat up, Remember that you have to take care of them, because if you don't, nobody else is. And then ultimately, what you need to do to help your leaders succeed. And the key is, is help them understand the right questions. One last story, and then we're out of here. Do we have time? You want to hear it? Yeah. So I'm working with this big organization that, I don't want to say the name of it because that's unprofessional, but they crashed a submarine into a mountain. Anyone filling in the blanks on that? <laughs> right? And it's not like a surprise mountain. It's not like, hey, where'd that mountain come from? It's like a mountain that was, that was on the chart. Like, this was a mountain. And they hit it. And nobody died, thank God. But it cost a lot of money. Like, like, uh, like billions with a B. A lot, a lot of money. I mean, it was expensive. And so they had this big meeting, and they said, hey, can you come and meet with all these senior leaders? All of them had the same first name, Admiral. Which, is that a German? I don't know that origin of that name. And I said, you know, I'm not traveling that much because the one thing the pandemic has taught me is that I'm pretty sure that I was on track to die in a Hampton Inn somewhere. <laughs> and I'm fixing that, right? And they said, well, we're bringing a taco truck to the meeting. And I said, well, why didn't you start there? Because a free taco truck, whew, I'm in, right? I mean, they parked it right at the meeting. You didn't even have to walk very far. It was great, right? So we have this big meeting, and this guy gets really mad, really, really mad. Because I don't know if you know this, but after this submarine crashed into this mountain, their corrective action was to place high-definition cameras in the conning towers of all submarines within the fleet worldwide. That was the corrective action. And I said the same thing you're thinking. Wow, that was an interesting choice, because now what you have is you're going to have a high-definition video 
of the operator smashing into the next mountain you hit. <laughs> Fair enough, right? And this man says to me, you're wrong. And I said, you invited me, and if it wouldn't have been for this taco truck, I wouldn't even be here. <laughs> and he said, you know as well as I do that putting those cameras is going to force those navigators into making better choices. Well, so here's what I'm going to tell you. It's not about navigators making better choices. It's about navigators having better choices. And the more we talked about it, it got really interesting. Chris can probably speak to this in great detail, but it has a lot to do with the brightness of the GPS screen. Okay? That's all I'm going to say. But the most interesting thing happened. As this guy was going to tear me down, he was pretty angry. So he was a senior executive in charge of safety for the entire Navy. So he was not a naval officer. He had on a suit, right? He was an SES. He said, you're wrong. And he was really mad. And the weirdest thing happened, you guys. Where they were having this meeting, there was this big glass wall, because that's where people with the first name Admiral have meetings. I mean, it was really nice. And right to this side, they're doing construction on a building next door. And they have scaffolding set up and workers in fall protection. So I said, well, let me use your same example and take us on a little journey. I said, let's take the scaffolding down and the fall protection off, and let's replace it with high-definition cameras. <laughs> and he said, you're comparing apples and oranges. And I said, or apples and apples, or oranges and oranges. Would you make those guys do that work with just the presence of cameras. And in that moment, the world shifted. That's not a function of having the right answer. That's the function of asking the right question. So here's my challenge for you. Meet three new people. Please do so. And I will ask you who you've met, so be ready to be quizzed on it. As Charles said earlier, listen to somebody you disagree with. You'll find them here. It's not hard because I think that makes it valuable. And then thirdly, have as much fun as you can possibly squeeze hanging out with each other. Thanks for your time, you guys. This was really fun.